Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 27 of Surah Al-Najm, he says, truly those who disbelieve in the hereafter name the angels with female names. As we mentioned in our previous session, one of the erroneous beliefs of the pagan Arabs was the idea that they would consider the angels to be the daughters of God. Now it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention <clears throat> to a relationship between <clears throat> belief in the hereafter and being conscious of what we say. It's as though the Qur'an is telling us that one of the true indicators of belief in the hereafter, belief in a world where there is accountability, is that you pay attention to what you say. And therefore, conversely, someone who doesn't believe in the akhirah is not cautious about what they say. They don't think before they speak. They don't contemplate and reflect before they make bold attributions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So guarding the tongue and exercising caution when it comes to speech is a true indicator of belief in the hereafter. There are many people that will claim to believe in life after death. Many will profess a belief in a day of judgment. But Allah Azza wa Jal here shows us an example of people who speak without knowledge, who attribute things to God without any rational basis. So when you believe that you will be held accountable, you're automatically going to be more cautious with what you say. This is why we have a beautiful hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam where he says, إِنَّ هَذَا اللِّسَانَ مِفْتَاحُ, مفتاح كُلِّ خَيْرٍ وَشَارٍ That this tongue is the key towards all goodness or all evil. So this tongue is the key. فَيَنْبَغِي لِلْمُؤْمِنِ The Imam continues, فَيَنْبَغِي لِلْمُؤْمِنِ أن يختم على لسانه كما يختم على ذهبه وفضته. Imam al-Baqir عليه السلام he says that this tongue is indeed the key to all goodness or the key to all that is evil. And therefore it is necessary for the believer to guard, to seal his tongue and guard his tongue in the same way that he guards his gold and his silver. You're very careful with your money. The Imam السلام, says you should exercise the same sort of vigilance when it comes to your tongue. Because in this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal makes a connection between guarding the tongue and belief in the hereafter. And Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Zukhruf, Surah number 43, ayah number 19, he criticizes the pagans. He says, وَجَعَلُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ إِنَاثًا That they have made the angels who are the servants of the beneficent, they have made them into females, they've made them into his daughters. And then Allah asks them, Allah says, were you there to witness the creation of angels for you to say with certainty that they are female and they are the daughters of God? So to be reckless with your words, my dear brothers and sisters, is a sign that you don't really believe in the day of judgment. Because your actions have to reflect a belief in a day of accountability, a day where Allah Azza wa Jal will call you to question for every single word that you uttered. In ayah number 28, Allah continues, and He says, وَمَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ 
Allah says, yet they have no knowledge of it. They follow nothing but conjecture, and surely conjecture avails not against the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here criticizes the pagans for formulating a belief system on incomplete information, on no knowledge. It's not based on a divine scripture. It's not based on the teachings of prophets. It's not based on any sort of evidence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs a sharp criticism. He says that they are making these attributions to me. They are formulating a belief system out of nothing. They have no knowledge. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is the beauty of Islam. Islam promotes knowledge. Islam encourages us to be people of ilm, to be people of learning, to be people who have evidence for our beliefs. It's unfortunate that in the West, the word faith, the word iman, the word faith has negative connotations. You know, if you look at the dictionary, if you look up the word faith in the dictionary, you'll find that in Western culture, faith is de defined as having a set of beliefs, holding beliefs despite of the fact that there's no evidence. That's why they call it faith. So faith is to have a belief even though there is no evidence for it. This is the Western definition of faith. But the Quranic definition, the Islamic definition for faith, for Iman, is a combination of two things. It's to have knowledge of reality, it's to have knowledge of the truth, and it's also to accept that truth. So faith, from an Islamic perspective, is actually having a belief system that is based on knowledge and accepting it. So it's, it's really comprised of two things. Knowing what is true and accepting what is true. So you see that Islam promotes knowledge and understanding and learning. But as you see, the disbelievers, they've based their entire belief system on conjecture. If you were to ask them, how do you know that the angels are female? They don't have any delil. They don't have any evidence. They don't have any proof. So you find that the pagans essentially desire to fashion reality according to their whims when this is impossible. Reality is not just what you claim. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in a beautiful hadith, he says, رَغْبَتُكَ فِي الْمُسْتَحِيلِ جَهْلٌ That desiring something that is impossible is a type of ignorance. And the pagans were demonstrating this type of ignorance. They have, they have this desire that religion will become subservient to their desires. They want a pantheon of gods who don't speak, who don't have any intelligence, because that type of god is acceptable to them. A type of god that does not give them orders, does not give them commandments, does not issue prohibitions. The Imam says to seek, to desire what is impossible is a sort of ignorance. And this is what the Kuffar are seeking. They're seeking the impossible. They want reality to conform with their desires and their whims. In the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in ayah number 29, he says, فَأَعْرِضْ عَمَّنْ تَوَلَّى عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَلَمْ يُرِدْ إِلَّا الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا Allah tells the Prophet, because the Holy Prophet ﷺ is the primary addressee of the Qur'an, even though Allah is speaking to all of us, 
the primary addressee of every verse in the Quran is Rasulullah. He says, فَأَعْرِضْ عَمَّنْ تَوَلَّى عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا So turn away. So shun whoever turns away from our reminder and desires nothing but the life of the world. There are two types of ignorant people, my dear brothers and sisters. You have someone who has jahal basirt, it's, it's called simple ignorance, whereby a person is ignorant and they are aware of their ignorance. They don't know something and they're aware of their ignorance. Such a person you can teach. This is a person that is willing to learn because they understand that their knowledge is limited. They know, they're cognizant of their ignorance. But then you have a second category of ignorance, which is called al-jahlul murakkab, which is compound ignorance. And that is someone who is ignorant, but they are ignorant of their ignorance. So he's jahil, but he considers himself alim. He doesn't know, but he thinks that he knows. So there are two levels of ignorance. They are ignorant, and they are ignorant of their ignorance. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the Prophet that there is only one way to deal with people who are willfully ignorant. Someone who is jahil, you can teach them. But what do you do about someone who is willfully ignorant, who thinks that they are knowledgeable when in fact they are ignorant? Allah tells the Prophet, turn away from them. You've delivered the message to them. Don't waste any more time on them. And we have to also learn this, my dear brothers and sisters. We have to be able to differentiate those who are ignorant from those who are willfully ignorant. If someone is so closed-minded and willfully ignorant, we should not waste our resources on them. We should not expend energy on trying to guide them and try to awaken them. Allah says, turn away from them. You've delivered the message. They have decided that they want to remain ignorant. Turn away from those who turn away from our reminder. The commentators of the Quran, they say that our reminder here most likely is a reference to the Holy Qur'an. The reminder here is a reference to the Qur'an. And then at the end of the ayah, Allah says, وَلَمْ يُرِدْ إِلَّا الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا It seems that there is a relationship between turning away from God and desiring the glitter and the glamour of this earthly life. So, the human heart, my dear brothers and sisters, has a void. Every human being wants to fill this void. If you don't fill it with God, you're going to end up filling it with dunya. Because the human being naturally feels that there is a hunger within him, that there is a void, there is an emptiness within him. So those who turn away from God, you see that they pursue dunya. They become obsessed with dunya because it's, there's, there's a hunger in them. But those who are mindful of Allah, those who are conscious of God, you find that they're not attached to the dunya because their heart is filled. As Allah says, they've satiated the soul. They have satiated that hunger. But when someone turns away from Allah, they start to pursue the dunya. They chase after it. So there's a relationship. There's an inverse relationship. The more obsessed you are with dunya, that's probably an indicator that you're away from Allah. The more mindful you are of Allah, Azza wa Jal, the, the less interested you are in dunya because you found something more valuable than the dunya.
And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he gives us a very important instruction. He says, Al-Qalbu Haramullah, that this heart, the heart of the human being, is the sanctuary of God. It's a haram. You know, if you go into the haram of Mecca, if you go to the haram of Amir al muminin and a small piece of najasa falls into it. How do you react? Right away you try to purify it. You try to remove that najasa. We have to start treating our hearts like they are a haram. The, the Prophet says the heart is the sanctuary of God. So do not allow anything to enter this sanctuary other than God. Because anything other than God that enters the heart is introducing an impurity in the heart. This is why people who spend their entire lives accumulating wealth, what do they do? So they make their heart, this haram, they make it the residence of dunya. They fill it with material things. What happens to them at the age of 40, 50, 60? They have what? They have a midlife crisis because you filled the heart with something that it wasn't meant to be filled with. A simple example is your car. Your car has a gas tank, yes? Your gas tank for your car is designed to hold gasoline. It's designed to hold gasoline. Your heart is designed to hold God. What happens if you put water in your gas tank? You fill it. It doesn't, it doesn't function. It doesn't run. You can destroy it. Why does it get destroyed? Because you filled it with something that it wasn't meant to be filled with. That's why it doesn't work properly. So when you fill the heart with something other than Allah, the heart breaks. It doesn't function. You damage it. So Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, those who turn away, He tells the Prophet, turn away from those who turn away from my, rem my remembrance, our reminder, and who are obsessed and desire the dunya. There's a relationship. The closer you are to Allah, the less interested you are in dunya. And the more, the further you are away from God, the more attached you are to dunya. This, this is the way to really determine if a person is truly close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muttaqeen are indifferent about dunya. They're not obsessed. They're not attached. And this is a way to really evaluate your own relationship with Allah. How much do you think about dunya? How obsessed are you with it? How much, how much time do you spend thinking about worldly affairs? This is an indicator of your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in ayah number thirty, He says, "Dalika mablaghum min al ilm." That is the extent of their knowledge. Surely your Lord knows best those who are rightly guided. Now what does it mean when Allah says that is the extent of their knowledge? This could be a reference to their erroneous belief system where they ascribe the angels as the daughters of God, that this is the extent of their knowledge. In a mocking way, Allah subhanahu Allah mocks them and says, This is the extent of their knowledge. Their knowledge is that they have a belief system that's based on zero evidence. So Allah calls it ilm to mock them. But others have said that no, it's also it also could be a reference to the fact that the, the, the knowledge that they have. The pagans, the kuffar, relates to dunya. That the extent of their knowledge is dunya. They know nothing beyond dunya. As Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran, what does He say? 
that there are people they only know the zahir they only know the apparent dimension of this world if you ask them about the stock market he knows everything about the stock market if you ask them about this political party he knows everything you ask him about business he knows everything about business but you ask him how to perform wudu no knowledge you ask him about tawheed zero knowledge you ask him about ethics morality they don't have any knowledge that's the extent of their knowledge their knowledge is only about worldly affairs they only know how to make money they only know about real estate they only know about you know the stock market there's a beautiful line in uh, in one of the du'as of the Holy Prophet that he used to recite in the month of Sha'ban. And alhamdulillah, we have begun the holy month of Sha'ban. And inshallah, we can spend some of these nights, some of these days, and recite some of the supplications of the Holy Prophet. One of the things that Rasulullah mentions in his du'as in the month of Sha'ban, he says, وَلَا تَجْعَلِ الدُّنْيَا أَكْبَرُ هَمِّنَا وَلَا مَبْلَغُ عِلْمِنَا Rasulullah sallallahu he teaches us in this du'a, he says, O oh Allah, do not make this world, this material world, our greatest concern there are some people dunya is their primary concern do not make it the extent of our knowledge make us people that know beyond this world that have knowledge that pertains to the akhirah knowledge that allows us to get closer to allah that allows us to be better human beings this is true knowledge so don't make dunya our greatest concern imam al-sadiq alayhi salam he says man asbaha wa amsa wa dunya akbar hammi ja'ala allah al-faqr bayna aynayn whoever goes to sleep at night and wakes up in the morning and dunya is his greatest concern the imam says allah puts poverty in front of his eyes meaning they're always afraid of poverty. They're running day and night to keep themselves from descending into poverty. It's as though there is a, a, an ominous cloud over their heads. That's why you see people, even who are wealthy, he's a multimillionaire, but he's always stressed. He always has anxiety because the dunya is his primary concern. But you see, awliyaullah, whether they are rich, whether they are poor, they're always at peace because they do not rely on the gift. Rather, they rely on the giver. The wealthy, they rely on the gift. Their sense of security comes from the gift, from the money, the wealth. Whereas awliyaullah, their sense of security comes from their nearness to the giver. ذَلِكَ مَبْلَغُهُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ اهْتَدَى Surely your Lord knows best those who are rightly guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows who is on the straight path. He knows those who go astray. He knows those who are pious. It's not our job to... You know, make a list of who is mu'min in my community and who is munafiq. That judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal, He knows the condition of the hearts. We can only judge on what we see. It is Allah Azza wa Jal that knows the reality of people. And sometimes what you see is not the reality. Allah knows who, who is rightly guided. And then in the next ayah, Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا بِمَا عَمِلُوا وَيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا بِالْحُسْنَى To God belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth. 
that he may recompense those who commit evil for that which they have done, and that he may recompense those who are virtuous with that which is most beautiful. Now again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of this ayah reminds us that everything belongs to him. That he is the owner of all things. And then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions his mercy and his justice. You know, one of my takeaway messages from this ayah is that when Allah punishes us for our sins, the punishment always fits the crime. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never excessive in his punishments because he's just. If you commit a sin, it's considered one sin, and the punishment is the punishment fits the crime. However, when we do good, the reward never fits the deed, the good deed. Allah gives you something even better. That's why Allah says, and that he may recompense those who are virtuous with that which is most beautiful. So the thawab, the reward for your deed is actually better than your deed. So it's not that you do one good deed and Allah gives you one reward. Allah multiplies the rewards. So he's very just when it becomes when it comes to punishment. Punishment always fits the crime. Allah is adil. But when it comes to reward, Allah is not just. He's generous. When you do good, he rewards you with something even more beautiful. You say, for example, the ahadith say that when two believers come together and they greet one another, Allah distributes 70 rewards. It's only one good deed, but Allah gives 69 hasanat to the one who initiates the salam. The reward doesn't really fit the good deed. Allah should just give that person one hasana. You did one good deed, and therefore you should receive one reward. But Allah says, Allah rewards those who do good, who are virtuous, with that which is most beautiful. So when it comes to reward, Allah is generous. He's merciful. When it comes to punishment, Allah is adil. He's fair. He's just. The punishment will always fit the crime. If, of course, he decides to punish. And then in ayah number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ إِلَّا الْلَمَمَ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ وَاسِعُ الْمَغْفِرَةِ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِكُمْ إِذْ أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ وَإِذْ أَنْتُمْ أَجِنَّةٌ فِي بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Allah says those who shun grave sins and indecencies, accept what is slight. Truly your Lord is a vast forgiveness. He knows you best from when he brought you forth from the earth and when you were hidden in your mother's bellies. So do not deem yourselves purified. He knows best the pious. Now, the question that arises when we read this ayah is that who will earn God's vast mercy on the day of judgment? Who will earn this, you know, this vast forgiveness of God? The, this ayah says that those who avoid kaba'ir, will be the recipients of this vast mercy. Now first we have to define our terms. So Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ Those who avoid the great sins. Kabair is the plural of kabira. Kabira means great. 
a great the great sins. Now, what are the kabbal? Now we have to bear in mind, brothers and sisters, that in in reality there is no such thing as a small sin, because the Holy Prophet he says, "La tanvur ila sigar al-dham, walakin unvur ila man asait." Do not look at the insignificance of the sin. Don't look at the smallness of the sin, but rather look at the one who you whom you have disobeyed. So sins are all major, but relative to one another, some sins are more serious than others. We have to understand that. So you should never say, oh, this is a minor sin. Every sin is serious. But there are some sins that are more serious than others when you compare them to one another. So relative to other sins, they're more serious. Now there is a difference of opinion with respect to the definition of a great sin, kaba'ir. Some of the ulama have said they've defined kaba'ir as al-dhunub al-lati warad al-wa'id min qibal Allah fi sha'niha wal-adab li murtakabiha. That great sins are those sins which Allah has threatened punishment for. Meaning that Allah has said that if you commit this sin, you will be punished for it with Jahannam. Now when you look at the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, so, so these major sins are the sins where Allah has issued a severe threat for the one who commits it. He threatens them with hellfire if they commit the sin. These are known as kaba'ir according to some. We also have a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, where they actually list the kaba'ir, these major sins. So, go, so going back to the ayah, the ayah is saying that if you avoid the kaba'ir and the fawahish, you will be qualified to receive this vast mercy of God. So what are the sins that we have to avoid? They're the kaba'ir. A hadith mentioned seven of them. The, now, this, of course, we're assuming that this is a mu'min. So we're not talking about kufr or shirk. These are sins that a mu'min may commit that are considered among the kaba'ir. Number one is qatlun nafs, to commit murder. Wal'iyadu billah. You, you murder someone. You kill an innocent person. This is kabira. This is a, a major sin. Number two, the ahadith mention to mistreat your parents. Allahu Akbar. Imagine that after mentioning murder, killing someone who's innocent, the Imams السلام, they mention among the sins to disrespect your parents, to mistreat them. In fact, we even have a hadith from Imam al Baqir where he says someone may have been dutiful to his parents. When they were alive, but after their death, the person becomes aq. He becomes someone who was who mistreated his parents. How? The Imam says because after they died, he never prayed for them. He never made dua for them. He never recited Quran for them. He never made up their qada prayers. That you forgot them after your death. You now you may meet Allah Azza wa Jal thinking that all oh, when my parents were alive, I took care of them. I treated them well, but on the day of Qiyamah, you'll be among those who were insolent towards his parents because you forgot them after they passed away. This is number two. Number three is aklur riba, to deal in usury. Because in an interest-based economy, usury, it damages the society. It makes the rich richer and the poor poor. People are not able to live. And when you create a society where wealth is not distributed evenly among people and you have people who are extremely poor, it leads them to commit crimes. People become desperate. Society crumbles when wealth is not distributed fairly. This is number three. Number four is al-awdatu ila dar al-kufri ba'd al-hijrah. That 
to go and live in a non-Muslim country after you lived in a Muslim country, meaning that you go to a place where you're not able to preserve your religious identity. Other ahadith say this is a ba'd al hijrah that you're not just allowed to live anywhere. When you choose to live somewhere, when you choose to move to a city or a place, you have to be able to guarantee and secure the iman of yourself and of those who you have, who you're responsible for, your children. You know, sometimes people, they live in places where there's no masjid, there's no community, but he goes there because he got a six-figure job. And he ends up losing his children because he wanted to make money. He committed a major sin. And Allah will hold him accountable for this. You can't just live wherever you want. You have to live in a place where you're able to practice Islam, where your family can become practicing Muslims. They can learn about their faith. There's a community. There's a masjid. There is some spirituality for them. There's an atmosphere where they can cultivate their religious identity. Number five is ramyul muhsanati bizina to accuse a married woman of fornication. And this is a big problem in some of our communities. You know, sometimes someone may see a picture posted on social media and they start making comments, oh, this sister does this, but when they don't have any evidence. To accuse someone of zina without any evidence is one of the greatest sins. So we have to be very careful about what we say about people. You know, just because someone is not dressed properly, just because someone's not wearing proper hijab, it doesn't mean that they're zania. You cannot make such an accusation. In fact, if you make such an accusation and you don't have four witnesses, you will be punished according to Islamic law for making that accusation. Allah wants to protect the dignity and the honor of the people. That's why Allah makes it so difficult to prove that someone committed adultery or fornication. Number six is to steal, to devour the wealth of orphans, to exploit them. It's one of the cardinal sins. And number seven, al-firaru min az to retreat, to run away in the battlefield, assuming that they're, you know, it's a time of jihad, and we're, you're under the banner of the Imam salam, for example, and you retreat, you run away, you leave the battlefield without an excuse. This is also considered one of the major sins. Other ahadith mention ten, some mention nineteen, but as I mentioned. We're talking about the sins that are major relative to other sins. So going back to the ayah, The word ithm, we translate it as sin. But the word ithm, according to linguists, is al-amalu al-ladhi yub'idu al-insan al-khayr. That the word ithm in Arabic it's any action that distances the human being from goodness because this is the nature of sin you're doing something that's taking you away from god that's taking you away from that which is good fawahish is the plural of fahisha it means something that's indecent something that's shameful and most of the time, fahisha refers to sins of a sexual nature. So avoiding kaba'ir, avoiding fawahish illa lamam. Lamam, I translated, translated it as slight sins. Some have said that they are minor sins. Now there's a difference of opinion with respect to the meaning of a lemon. We have a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He says, أَلَّمَمُ الرَّجُلُ يَلِمُّ بِهِ الذَّنْبِ فَيَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِنْ 
that alamam are those sins that you commit and you feel guilty and you repent for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you avoid if you avoid committing the kaba'ir and you have this lemon that you've committed sins but you've sought repentance for it, you will earn the vast mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. There's another hadith where the Imam السلام, gives another definition of al lemma He says, Al-Limamu al-Abdu al-Ladhi yalimmu bil-Dhanb ba'da al-Dhanb laysa min saliqatihi ay min tabi'atih. The Imam السلام, he says that there are some sins that we commit. You know, mu'mineen, they're not infallible. Mu'mineen also commit sins. But the Imam says that there are some sins that you commit because of circumstances, because of your heedlessness, and they are out of character. Meaning that you don't do them to such an extent that they become a habit for you. These are the type of sins that Allah forgives very easily. You know, there are, you know, for, so for example, you have someone who drinks alcohol, and it's become a habit for them. It's part of their nature. At home, at work, they drink. So this is not what a lemon is. And then you have someone, for example, that he's at work and there's a, a luncheon at work. He doesn't drink, but he sits at the table where alcohol is being served. Meaning that because of the conditions, because of the circumstances, he did something, he committed a sin, no doubt, but he did something that was out of character for him. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, Allah is very forgiving when it comes to the sins that we commit that are out of character, that have not become a habit for us. But Allah is very severe in punishment when it comes to the sins that people commit on a regular basis and they become so consistent that they, that, that they become a part of their nature. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, "Huwa a'lamu bikum idh ansha'akum min al -ar. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows of our actions. He knows what sins have become second nature to us, and He knows the sins that we commit that are out of character, because He knows us. He knows us so well. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And He knows us because He created us from the earth. He knows us so well because He knew us when we were in the wombs of our mothers. So if Allah knows us to this degree, of course He knows our actions. Of course He knows what sins have become our habits and what sins we've committed out of heedlessness or the sins that we've committed that are out of our character. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ So do not deem yourselves purified. هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى When Allah says, do not deem yourselves pure, the commentators of the Qur'an, they say that this part of the ayah was revealed in reference to some Muslims who had a habit of bragging. You know, they used to say, oh, you know, we perform our prayers, we fast, we go to Hajj. They started to brag about how righteous they were. They started to list all of their good deeds. They started to share with people all of the wonderful things that they do. Allah says, do not deem yourself pure. Don't brag. Do not boast about yourself. Do not praise yourself. It's not a good quality, brothers and sisters, to brag about yourself, to boast. A mu'min is humble. A mu'min doesn't broadcast his good deeds and his credentials. 
Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam in a hadith, he says, لا يفتخر أحدكم بكثرة صلاته وصومه وزكاته ونسكه Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, do not boast about your prayers. Don't talk, don't say, oh, I pray this many nawafil, I never miss salatul layl. Do not boast about the abundance of your prayers and your fasting and your zakat. Don't broadcast to the world that I donated $25,000 to the masjid or I gave $50,000 to the fuqara. Don't broadcast your deeds. Do not brag about yourself. Because Allah knows who is truly pious. Maybe the one who prays all the nawaf and maybe they're not, they maybe they're not people of taqwa. Maybe they're doing maybe they have ulterior motives. Maybe they're doing it for the sake of being praised. Maybe they're doing it to show off. Perhaps they're doing it because of social pressure. Don't brag. Allah knows who has true iman in their hearts. It's interesting that when you when you look at Nahjul Balagha, in Nahjul Balagha, Amir al Mu'minin used to correspond with Muawiyah. Muawiyah, when Amir al Mu'minin became the Khalifa, of course, Imam Amir al Mu'minin wanted him to, he, want, he's, he removed him from power. But of course, being as power hungry as Muawiyah was, he refused to step down from his position as the governor of, uh, of Syria. So he started to write letters back and forth to the Imam, and Muawiyah tries to provoke Amir al Mu'minin. He writes him a letter essentially accusing the Imam of being jealous of Abu Bakr and Umar, saying that they are superior to you and you were envious of them. So Muawiyah makes these comments to Amir al Mu'minin to provoke the Imam. You know, so he's throwing the bait, hoping the Imam will attack Abu Bakr and Umar and create fitna. But Amir al Mu'minin السلام, doesn't even acknowledge Abu Bakr and Umar in the letter, he doesn't take the bait. And in the letter, the Imam, he says to Muawiyah, وَلَوْلَا مَا نَهَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ مِنْ تَزْكِيَةِ الْمَرْءِ نَفْسَ لَذَكَرَ ذَاكِرٌ فَضَائِلًا جَمَّ تَعْرِفُهَا قُلُوبُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The Imam alayhi salam in the letter, he says if it was not for the prohibition of Allah that a person should not praise himself, I would have mentioned many fadail, many fadail about myself that the hearts of the mu'mineen all are aware of. So Amir al-Mu'mineen in the letter, he refrains from listing to Muawiyah all of his achievements. Why? Because of this ayah where Allah says, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not deem yourselves purified. Do not boast about yourselves. Now when Imam al-Sadiq was asked about this ayah, this part of the ayah, you know, he was probably asked about Imam Zainul al -Abidin, you know, in the, in Sham, we know the famous khutbah of Imam Zainul al-Abidin, an ibn Makkata wa Mina, an ibn Zamzam wa Safa, where the Imam speaks about the merits of the Ahlul Bayt, u'atina sitan wa fuddilna bisab, Imam al-Sadiq, and we have many ahadith where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they praise themselves. So the Imam, he says, it is not allowed for someone to praise himself except if they are compelled to. Naam. If you are compelled to do so in order to achieve a higher goal. And Imam al-Sadiq, he gives the example of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. When Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam sees that the economy of Egypt is falling apart, he requests to become the treasurer. 
make me the treasurer over Egypt. Why? Because I am trustworthy and I am knowledgeable. So he's, he's speaking about his own abilities, about his own credentials. But why? Yusuf السلام, wasn't just bragging. He was mentioning his credentials for a higher purpose. So he can guarantee economic prosperity to the people of Egypt. So he can look after the fuqara, make sure that corrupt people do not hoard the wealth of Egypt for themselves. So you find that the general rule is believers should not boast about themselves. They should not praise themselves. And inshallah, we'll conclude with this narration from Amir al-Mu'mineen where the Imam alayhi salam, so you shouldn't praise yourself as the Quran mentions, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ But what happens if someone else praises you? How should you react? When someone else begins to sing your praises. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says that if someone praises you, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says if someone praises you, you should say three things, not out loud, but to yourself. You should ask Allah for three things. Oh Allah, number one, do not judge me according to what they say. This person may be calling you someone who's muttaqi, a pious person. You don't want Allah to judge you among the muttaqin on the day of judgment because Allah holds the muttaqin to a very high standard. So number one, oh Allah, do not judge me according to what they say. Do not hold me to a standard that I'm unable to meet on the day of judgment. Number two, oh Allah, make me better than what they say. So if they're praising me, give me the tawfiq to surpass their opinion of me. This is number two. And number three, and perhaps the most important, this person is praising you. This person is speaking highly of you. Oh Allah, number three, oh Allah, forgive me for the sins that they are unaware of. They see me in public domains, but they have not seen me when I was in, 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 the prim in privacy. They're not aware of the sins that I have committed behind closed doors. So, oh Allah, do not judge me according to what they say. Make me better than what they say. And forgive me for the sins that they are not aware of. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and make us among the muttaqeen in this life. And may Allah grant us the shafa'ah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad on the day of judgment. Yawma la yanfa'u manu wa la banun. إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد